Hello, welcome. This is ModX Network Voices. I'm Ryan Smith, Washington State University. I'm joined uh, by my partner, Ivan Rupnik. Ivan, like to say hello to the, the crowd. Hi, everybody. Uh, Ivan and I like to have folks on and uh, interview them. And the focus of ModX is to disseminate as widely as possible and share knowledge around the topics of industrialized construction. And uh, in particular, this uh, episode today and this discussion today will be about uh, carbon management and some of the work that's going on at McGill University. Welcome uh, Salman Craig, assistant professor, uh, and also his colleague who we've had on here before and, and good friend Kiel Mo. Um, Kiel is uh, the Gerald Chef chair position and they have both been working on um, uh, the role of timber in uh, circular economies and carbon management. And so they'll be talking a little more about that and uh, ventilated envelopes and some of their research, which is quite fascinating. Welcome, uh, Sal, and welcome, Kiel. Thanks for coming. Thanks very much, Ryan. I bet it's great to be here. Uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit more, uh, Sal, and tell us about yourself. And I think you have a presentation to share, and then we'll have some questions afterwards. So. My pleasure, yeah. Um, Salman, you can call me Sal. Um, yeah, born and raised in the in London, in the UK. Um, did um, an engineering doctorate in in building physics with uh, um, Bureau Happel Consulting Engineers. They were the, the sponsor of, of of my research, and and um, ended up uh, being a facade engineer for a, for a, a couple of years there. Afterwards, um, worked in a lot of projects in the. Middle East, extreme thermal env environments and, uh, and, 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 and materials, for example, Abu Dhabi Louf. And then I moved to Foster and Partners, the specialist modeling group. Um, most of my time working there were, it was on, on two projects, the Apple Campus in Cupertino and, and, and even more so the uh, Bloomberg headquarters in, 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 in London. Um, uh, about the of the art of, of, of natural buoyancy ventilation and and and, and um, material systems that really harness um, ambient energy and that 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 um, but I, I wasn't satisfied enough with uh, um, with where you could take materials technology in the context of, of live projects so I, I I felt I really needed to um, uh, get into academia and start my own laboratory. Uh, fortunate enough to 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 get to know Kiel, um, and I he he was at the Harvard uh, Graduate School of Design, and and I started uh, lecturing there, and building a relationship with Kiel, and we've since both moved to to McGill to start something serious. And I'm a great believer that that two two minds together are not just doubly good, but can be exponentially. Uh, uh, good and and we're we're expanding that that network now and 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 it's we're on the cusp of being very exciting together. That's good. That's wonderful to hear. And uh, uh, certainly, uh, finding like minds to work together as Ivan and I have is critical to try and move the needle, especially in your particular area. And so it's it's great to see. Uh, some news uh, that we will also post in the YouTube link about uh, your center and a new building. Um, and uh, people can follow that great, great uh, movement. Uh, Sal, why don't you go ahead and uh, share your screen and, and present to us uh, what research you're working on. Um, love, to, love to see it. Uh, sure. Do you see that now? Great, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, my primary interest is, 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 is rethinking building envelopes radically. Um, and it's aligned very, in a very fascinating way with, with how we treat carbon over life cycles as well in buildings and across the, the building in, in industry. Um, what I've been thinking about in different ways over the last 10 years or so is, is how to consider building envelopes, not as thermal insulators, but, but as heat exchangers. And what are the opportunities for radical integration and, and, and a fundamentally new 
way of thinking about about how we design and assemble buildings if if we if we take a different thermal architecture uh, as an approach um, the um, it's sort of my my ten year research for for Metro, which is part of a larger network with Kiel and, and other partners, is, is to develop integrated biomaterials and, and value-added supply chains that can obviate construction-related carbon emissions at, at the gigaton scale. This is, this is we, we have to get towards um, strategies that can obviate in the order of gigaton per annum uh, to make a dent in, in construction-related emissions and, and turn steer the steer this big ship from increasing emissions year on year at, at about 40 percent of total global emissions and, and start to bring it bring it down very quickly uh, uh, towards um, to, towards uh, uh, zero um, so part of that a big question is is you know how you know where where biomaterials fit into that equation um, if all if all construction materials uh, an ultimate consume by systems. You know what 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 does what does that mean for the the construction industry and our supply chains? So on the one hand, um, this will involve understanding the capacity and resilience of of these ecosystems, such as live forests, uh, to provide these services. Um, you know, and and how our supply chains need to coordinate and and collaborate with these living systems in 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 order to do that these, these complex and adaptive systems, but on on the other hand, the the research is about uh, design and and how to build with radically less stuff. Um, you know, our whole supply chain is organized around these four functional um, building assembly categories as the cat, uh, categories as you know you could you could you could pick out of any modern building and it and it and it's sort of arranged like this um, and and they're treated more or less separately and and we have a like count in the last few decades we have countless countless materials and products filling specialized functional niches niches that sort of need need not exist uh, 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 across this uh, these functional categories so how can we cut across these uh, categories and render them, you know, useless with with integrated forms of of, of biomass? That that's that's what we're we're, we're looking at, um, because we know if we want if we want to seriously draw down carbon and uh, avoid carbon emissions in in, in of a life cycle of buildings and across the construction industries, simple material substitution is not going to be enough. Um, uh, we need we need to go towards the thing. Uh, bio monomaterial structures biogenic um, uh, materials uh, structures that can replace as many other materials products components and systems as possible and and my research is about the ra radical integration of these functions uh, achieve and we need to design material architectures at, at different scales sort of from the micron to sort of the the, the meter scale um, that orchestrate um, and um, heat and mass flows at, at, at different scales. Um, to illustrate what I mean by that, I'm going to give an example of uh, from nature about how termite mounds work thermally, um, how they harness uh, free energy in the environment for, for their air conditioning. Uh, and and then, then I'm going to surprise you by, by saying that, you know, we, we can replicate this behavior with wood buildings. And they don't need to look like termite mounds in order to do this. But before I give the example of the termite mound, um, I'm showing you this video because you need to understand what buoyancy ventilation is, right? Because um, that's key to harnessing ambient heat in a, in a, in a lot of the real um, engine project that, that we're working on. So these, these two simulations show two different kinds of buoyancy ventilation. That's thermally driven uh, uh, ventilation. We're actually using salt baths here um, turned upside down. Salt is denser than water, so it so it drops, um, and it so it, it represents very accurately if you scale scale a model down right without heat rising, and you, if you turn the video upside down. Um, so here is displacement ventilation, and that's good for for accessing uh, for flushing out excess heat in in the summer. Um, you know, and if you know how much heat is being generated in the building and how tall your building is, you, you can get the right temperature inside, but also the right ventilation flow rate. 
here's a more recent discovery. Uh, it's called mixing ventilation, which is just just beautifully elegant. It's actually great for recycling heat in 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 the shoulder season or, or winter season. Um, it, it's it's coming in a bit. So um, this is still displacement ventilation. You can see the rising and fresh in uh, spontaneously. Oh, and this is not. Does this ever go to? Okay, no, it never goes to mixing ventilation. My bad. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You're getting the you're getting the principle of of hot air rising and moving, and that, and that and that we can harness that, and that and that doesn't matter. But now you have a a, a moving mental image of how buoyancy ventilation works, right? Um, we can visit a termite mound and and understand how it harnesses ambient energy for for air conditioning. So there have been an, an, a number of hypotheses for uh, for how they work, from from um, wind wind powered pistons internally to to metabolizing termites, generating the heat, to solar powered chimneys. Uh, but the scientists always had trouble getting inside the termite mounds and actually taking real measurements. And 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 then in 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 2015, uh, one team from Harvard managed to on the difficulties for the first time, termites attacking the sensors and, and everything. And they studied this particular species in, in India um, where the mounds are, are in forests. Um, then they could neglect, you know, for the, the influence of, 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 uh, of solar radiation or wind and, and, and see how, how things are working. And it concluded to the surprise of, of many scientists that it was the thermal mass of the material that regulated everything, the temperature, humidity, and the ventilation. And I'm gonna explain how that, how that works. So here's the, the internal organization of, of the, the, the termite mound there. Um, everything above the nest is the AC system, right? And it's in service of the fungus farm below. Um, so the termites uh, cultivate this fungus uh, like as farmers. Um, and, and that's what they eat. And so the, the fungus needs to be kept at, at certain temperature and humidity. As, it's, as the fungus is growing, it, it produces carbon dioxide, which also needs to be vented out and replenished by, by oxygen. So the AC system is not really for the termite mounds, it's for, it's for, it's for, it's for the fungus. And the way it works is this. At, so at, at nighttime, the mass towards the exterior uh, cools down towards the temperature of the, the exterior air. Um, the mass inside um, uh, the mound is still relatively hot from the day prior. That sets up a temperature difference. And so the, the hot air um, in the, 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 the air in the central conduit is, is relatively warmer. And so that rises up. And then the air in, in, the, in the conduits towards the exterior is relatively cooler. And that sets up a, a buoyancy cycle. Of, of ventilation going 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 round, at uh, during the daytime it flips the other way, right? So the now the mass towards the exterior is heating up, uh, um, and the mass towards the exterior is relatively cool, and so that the cycle flips. What this allows it to do, this cycle, this conveyor belt, is to is to transport um, CO two particles to the top. Of, of the mound where there are these pores and the CO2 can diffuse through these pores and, and oxygen is replenished in the other direction. So it, it, it exchanges fresh air while keeping, while keeping uh, moisture inside, inside, the, inside the building. But it's, it is, the, it, it is the, the way that this material architecture, this massive architecture harnesses ambient energy from the exterior temperature, temperature uh, oscillations, which is the, of the real interest uh, uh, to, to architecture, I think, right? So it's, 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 it's extracting thermodynamic work from, from, this, uh, from this exterior temperature cycle. The good news is that your, your building doesn't need to look like a, a termite mound to work like one. You can couple buoyancy ventilation and thermal mass in a natural feedback cycle, you know, up during the night, up during the night and down during the day, just by getting the material proportions of your thermal mass right. And it, it turns out that these scaling rules um, apply to practically any construction material, even wood, right, which is not normally renowned uh, for its thermal mass properties.
So in 2019, I defined uh, these, these scaling rules um, mathematically. Um, they are ratios, mathematical ratios that show you how to optimize an internal thermal mass so that for any chosen free running temperature, like the, the, the temperature that the interior would naturally stabilize at, um, you can maximize the buoyancy ventilation that that mass produces. Yeah. So this contour map represents the design space of all possible uh, thermal mass architectures with internal thermal mass, uh, all possible proportions and all possible materials uh, and ventilation rates and temperature damping. And the blue spine shows design where the thermal mass and the and ventilation exchanges are, are perfectly synchronized and, 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 and a balance. So you're getting the, the, the most thermodynamic work per, per unit of, of thermal mass material. Um, we, we package these scaling rules in, um, in, in, up in a free app and also in a, in a grasshopper definition and um, which they're free to download. I'll give these links here. Uh, you choose the thermal mass material, the, the temperature damping and the rate of buoyancy ventilation on the map to produce return optimal thickness and surface area of that internal mass. Okay, so this is going to be, I think this, we think this is incredibly useful for, for, for climate resilient design in, in the future, for a resilience to heat waves, uh, um, uh, for, for instance, but, but many other things. And I just, just to iterate here, this is, this is not deep computation here. I'm not doing anything clever with computation here, that there's just some simple, meaningful, robust mathematical relationships that help you balance the proportions of of your building thermally. Uh, so you balance the rates of heat exchange between the mass and, and the ventilation in a diurnal cycle. With these new scaling rules, we can play with some interesting massing games. So let's use Jennifer, Jennifer Bonner's, um, Bonner's house gables as an example um, by asking, at what point do, do these CLT roofscapes start doing the same thermodynamic work as, as, as a concrete thermal mass, right? So, and here I'm defining si the size, not so much as floor area, but, um, but by how much ventilation the mass produces and how many people this ventilation rate would serve, all right? So in this case, the, the, the masses both produce enough ventilation for, for 10 people um, at, at 10 liters per second per person, which is, which is a standard rate for, for non-residential buildings, all right? Um, so it turns out that the work can do the same thermodynamic work as so the wood can do, wood thermal mass building can do the same thermodynamic work as a concrete building, but you need 80% more surface area in, in order to, to achieve that because of the difference in thermal properties between the materials, um, which could easily be taken up by, by the gabled roof, uh, roofscape here. Um, all right, and with this, you are able to also compare the, the, the embodied carbon um, lower and upper end rates in, 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 in a quick way, in an easy way. Here's a medium building defined as the internal mass that produces an, enough ventilation for 50 people, right? So the required surface increases for both, uh, substantially for both buildings, right? Concrete versus wood. Uh, but the wood building still needs 80% more relatively than, than, than the concrete building. That multiplication factor will change depending on what temperature damping you're, you're aiming for. Here it's a, a temperature damping of 70%. You can see on the, the graph on the left, uh, left there. But basically more damping means more surface, more, more right. Um, finally, here are the results for, for a large building serving 100 people. Um, so notice here, for example, the, the error associated with the surface area. area. Uh, so for a wood massing, the error is as much as 400 meter square or 16%, right? You, you're, um, the, the exact surface area you need is, is, is unknown. You're, you, it's going to be somewhere um, of order um, uh, 2,000 square meters or so, and, and it's, it's going to vary by a certain percentage. And that's because we're using generic thermal properties here. Um, you could use more specific thermal properties and that, that, that that error range would reduce. But the point is, is that this is something that you could do very quickly in a, in a morning and, and, and be able to compare like for like in a fair way, how two different materials would perform in, in your early massing stages. Yeah. Um, 
so here's a summary of results showing how everything scales, right? And it's important to emphasize that these three pairs perform equivalently, right? Um, the same free running temperature, the same rate of ventilation production. And that's important because in life cycle um, analysis and carbon accounting, you can't do a fair comparison unless you have a well-defined functional unit. So we're trying to move beyond simple conversations is that concrete's good for thermal mass, uh, but has, has, is, is bad for the planet and wood is rubbish for thermal mass, but is good for the planet. I mean, we ha you, you have to do like serious, uh, we have to much more nuanced and measured conversations and you need, you need technical, technically fair basis for comparison to, to be able to do, to, to do that and elevate the conversation in, in, in the construction industry today. So we're working with a team of researchers at, at Rural Studio at Auburn University in Alabama and at McGill uh, to test these scales in, in real life. So on, on the left are some pilot data for small pods, um, a meter high, um, confirming that the coupling works between thermal mass and buoyancy ventilation as expected. So you can see in that graph, the swing of buoyancy ventilation produced by the wood thermal mass. Uh, it goes up during the, the night when the mass is, is warm and relative to the exterior and down during the day. So a downdraft, a natural downdraft, uh, predictable like, like clockwork. And on the right, you see plans for a larger test buildings, which we're, um, we're building down there in Alabama this summer. We, we hope to show definitively that, that wood thermal mass can perform as well as concrete thermal mass, as long as you have the right amount of extra surface, as long as you proportion that building uh, um, in the right way. So that's, that's one kind of envelope as heat exchanger. It's a heat exchanger with the interior, but it's, it's extracting thermodynamic work from the exterior uh, temperature oscillations, right? So for, for temperature control, but also producing ventilation. And, and it's interesting because that, we know that, that for wood thermal mass, that it could also double or uh, triple up with st the structure. Um, there's, a, there's another sort of, more um, radical um, way of designing building envelopes as heat exchangers, which is a, a longer term technology development project that, that, that we're work, working on. Um, so, we, and it helps to, to, to consider how, how heat exchangers are employed in today's in modern building assemblies. So this is, this is this is how uh, modern buildings are designed uh, currently. So you, the idea for them to be thermally efficient is that you super insulate the envelope, make it super airtight. You have um, an air distribution system which brings in fresh air um, and exhaust stale air. And then as part of that, somewhere in that system, somewhere in that ductwork, somewhere in the air, central air handling unit, for example, there is a heat exchanger depicted by these arrows. And the fresh uh, cold air is coming in. It um, is put in thermal contact with the warm stale air, but those streams do not mix, right? They're just put in thermal contact. And so that the fresh uh, cold air is preheated um, with, with the outgoing stale air. Um, what we're interested in is whether we can apply that heat exchange principle uh, to the building envelope itself, right? And this is how it would, this is how in principle it, it, it would work. So with an, with an airtight wall, wall, you can see heat, you can imagine heat moving from inside to outside by conduction through, through the thermal envelope. Now let's consider just for a moment, um, like a rogue pore or, or channel in the, in the envelope. Um, you have the, the fresh cold air being thin wind, for example. Imagine that that fresh cold air as it's coming in is bound to be preheated to some degree uh, before it enters the, the, the interior. So what, what's happening there is, is some of the heat is being rerouted to that airstream, right? So what if, what if we could optimize the pore size thing and spacing so that you could balance the convection inflow with the conduction outflow, 
right? By fitting the material flow, so you, the material to the flow, so that you balance those two thermal streams and recover as much heat from the envelope that would otherwise be lost to the environment, okay? Uh, so this sets up this sort of Goldilocks scenario where if the hole, the holes are too big, um, there isn't enough and, and the material itself to actually recover enough heat in time before it, before it um, makes its way across the envelope. Um, equally, if the holes are too small, there'd, there'd be too much friction and, and we'd need too much suction to, to overcome, uh, um, there'd be too much friction to overcome and pressure to overcome to, for us to do it feasibly. So there's this balance point where um, for a reasonable amount of pressure difference, something that you could sustain with a, with a fan or ideally in, in our case by buoyancy ventilation, you can, you can balance those, those flows. And that, this equation at the bottom, it, it's from a paper, um, written a, a while back that I, I came across in 2009, which was, and it was this, this co design correlation meant for aerospace engineering, where uh, you could, it would allow you to, to, to optimize a porous material for, for um, uh, gas turbine blades in, in aerospace um, to fight against overheating. So you can push air or gas or another fluid through through these pores to fight against the, the overheating from, from the extreme temperatures um, in, in, the, in the gas turbine engine. Um, and what, what we've done um, in a series of papers since 2017, the most re recent one uh, in 2021, is to demonstrate that this, this, this design method, this correlation meant for aerospace, can be applied to building envelopes. Right. In 2017, we, we demonstrated that that it would just generically work for 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 any standard construction material. We tested with con with concrete, glass, and and wood, and showed that it was still valid, even though that the, the, the temperature differences and pressures were much smaller than 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 in than in air space. And in in 2007, uh, most recently in 2021, we we, we published a study showing that that wood actually seems to be the, the most promising material to do this. And there's a very, very clear thermal reason um, for this. It's, it's that you're, we're bringing in a, a certain amount of fresh air and we want to thermally match that fresh air with, with the conduction going out. And if we use a material like concrete or steel, which is highly conductive, we just need so much to bring in an unfeasible amount of fresh air to be able to balance those two flows. But it turns out that the, that wood, as well as also having these, these wonderful structural properties and ecological properties, um, is just enough of lower thermal conductivities where we can, we can balance this in a, in a really interesting way. Um, so um, we, the, when we're looking at this, just to give you a sense of scale, we, we've, we found that we can do this with, with standard thicknesses of, of CLT, say, say 15 centimeters or so, and that the holes uh, would be about 10 centimeters spaced apart and about sort of two millimeters uh, or, in, or five millimeters in, in diameter to, to find the, to hit the, the optimum range. And, um, the, here's a picture of the Sankey, di uh, Sankey diagram from, from the paper, which is showing how the heat exchange works. But I want to point out this, this app, which is, which is free uh, to download in association with that paper, and, and, and you can use it there. And it's showing all the parameters that we're, we're balancing just with the designing holes. Um, uh, it's, um, but the the big takeaway here is that what we found, we can approach U values or we can approach R values and U values uh, approaching passive house standards with, with medium ventilation rates. So in, in metric, we can, we can approach U, U values of 0 0.2, 0 0.15 um, with ventilation flow rates of about 10 liters per second per, per meter squared of, of panel. So, so think of it as, a, as, an, as enough ventilation for, for one person per every square meter of panel. 
Um, but we can approach these these very low U values and, and so in principle be able to eliminate exterior insulation and, and cladding and, and, and so on and so forth. That's where we're at the stage, that's the stage where we're at uh, theoretically and experimentally. Uh, and now we have basic validation of that the theory works uh, with wood and other biogenic materials. Um, the real research starts now. So it really exploring that design, look the implications for architecture um, and, and really characterizing the, the range of thermal performance and long-term carbon cycling for of biogenic buildings when, when, we're, when we're thinking of buildings as envelopes as heat exchangers. All right, thank you. Thanks, Sal. Um, and thanks, Kiel, for, for joining us and for this really thought-provoking presentation. Um, so actually, maybe a little bit of background. Also, the reason that we uh, were very excited to bring you into this context of industrialized construction, and particularly industrialized wood-based construction, is that uh, in Europe and the US, uh, mass timber and particularly has had some obstacles in growth. Uh, in, in Europe, it has to do more with cultural barriers we found just in the perception of wood related to fire. Uh, but that are built baked into uh, regulations. In your in the US, there's a bigger problem, uh, which is and that's baked in to cost. It's also baked into means and methods. Um, and I think one of the things that I, uh, you know, ten years ago or more, uh, when Keel published uh, sort of his work on sort of his critique of the stick versus the stack, uh, there was an idea that the stack or monolithic building elements that are uh, that can perform multiple functions uh, are better for architects, they're better for the environment, they're better for users. Uh, but I think that the challenge was how do we quantify that uh, in a capitalist environment where we have a certain perception of what cost, what, what we understand costs something and what we understand don't understand. Uh, and so it's just interesting maybe to start the conversation to think about uh, uh, how do you see this impacting conventional construction, particularly in, in North America, where wood-based construction is, is, is it, it's a unique condition, unlike continental Europe, Africa, Asia, we have a high, we have a high percentage of use of wood-based construction. We ask very little of it on the inter systems that are not, uh, that are not very e uh, ecological, but because we believe that they're economical. Uh, so I guess for us and for, I think for the audience, particularly those that are making big investments in their capacity and capability and are, uh, and are looking for ways to get value out of those investments. How do you see those misalignments realigning through this and other research about this, the hidden performance, particularly of wood uh, and wood-based systems? That's a great question. Kiel, did you, uh, I have something to say, but yeah, you I'll want to jump, jump in? But, um, no, I think, I think placing the discussion in terms of value is really important, Ivan. Um, I think one way that you can look at what Sal just presented to us is that the, the, the kind of inherent proposition is transforming, let's say, the timber industry from being structure only to now being what we otherwise would call or think of as insulation that we'd otherwise think of as and if that all gets merged into one system, so it has much more value. Even fire protection. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's, e there's I think, several other value chains that are, are merging uh, through this kind of thinking. Uh, and I think that's where, you know, from a kind of capital point of view, there might be just like really clear reasons and motivations to take this on. Uh, but we also know that there's inherent architectural and potential ecological value in this as well. So that's why we've identified it as a kind of, you know, bright spot, you know, that it, it can speak to multiple audiences. It's not just sort of ideal for architects or ideal for a, a forester or something like that. But if we can make the handshakes in the right way, then it, it, it becomes a much more coherent uh, value chain, uh, you know, across the, you know, building industry as a kind of terrestrial proposition. Thanks, Kiel. I, I think, I, I agree. Uh, I th think, um, works if those heat exchangers actually work and we're able to, to, to develop uh, serious propositions that are coordinated. Um, I, you know, I don't think it will be the case where, where we're having to make kind of piecemeal economic 
arguments, I think it would be sort of demonstrably cheaper because just in a dis quite a disruptive way, actually. I think we're, we, you know, historically we're, we're, we're sort of at, at a, a social cognitive limit for how fragmented the, the areas of knowledge are in the construction industry. I, I don't think it can get any more disparate. And, and I think there's inevitably going to conversion. Um, con convergence across those disparate streams, and and that that's going to change how um, um, uh, how cognitive labour is 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 organised, uh, and building assemblies are organised across the industry. I, I always think about um, my time in an engineering consultancy uh, at Bureau Happold, and and you know there was a discipline for every specialism, right? You know, and they just kept growing, and 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 da -da 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 -da. and there's a point where just sort of everyone. Was looking around, it's just like how how most, how many small specialisms do we do we get? You know, um, I, so if 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 we can converge these functions in a, in a, in, in with, a, with a proper proposition, I think it just becomes you you you, you undercut so many things that it that it just it just becomes quite 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 ob obvious as a proposition. But there's a long way to go before that happens. And just to build on that a little bit. Um... Uh, into that then, if we if we want to get to that convergence, uh, right now mass timber, various aspects of offsite construction, I think are are kind of situated in a discussion of material substitution that maybe wood is better than concrete and steel or something like that. But um, you're not going to get to this level of convergence through a material substitution mentality. Uh, what we need to substitute is our assumptions about building and and what like what we think of as wood or what wood could do in a building environment. Uh, so there's some bigger scale, you know, kind of cognition, uh, you know, substitutions that need to go on uh, that I find tremendously exciting. It's, it's very refreshing to kind of re rethink building at this point. And I think that's something that the offsite uh, construction industry is, is very invested in doing. And I, so I hope this kind of work can, you know, only amplify uh, that aspect of what offsite is doing right now. Could you talk a little bit, um, Sal, could you talk a little bit more about uh, the role of rural studio? I see it in a paper that you've written um, or what the future role of rural studio, I'm assuming that's field-based application of, of uh, this proof of concept, but um, maybe you could talk more about that and, and how you see that maturing. It's a great question. Um, um, you will have plenty to say as well. I'll, I'll just, just say that we've, we've been fortunate enough since 2007, we've, we struck up a, a relationship with Andrew, Andrew Freer and, and just as he was developing a new master's program, research-based master's program. And uh, we're now on this, the second round of that, taking a, a graduate research team through design build on, on building science and, and construction ecology research and um, it, it's just really a, really an, an opportunity there and um, because you know what it gives us is the the opportunity to not uh, to, to approach these questions not in a siloed way right so so to, to 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 do building science through construction and think through construction ecology through through construction in, 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 a, in a way together and and much of the much of the um, science work that needs to happen for for these integrated building assembly assemblies some of it needs to happen in a lab right but many of it much of it ha needs to happen through building on on in the field and, and on site so it's just been um, uh, a, a fantastic opportunity and we, we hope it grows we, we we're um, we're on the cusp of starting a um, our own design build program in in McGill. We've had a, a big in, injection of, of of funding for a new um, a research, a research facility, which will eventually host a, a design build uh, program, a, a kind of rural studio of the north, uh, a, 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 you know, um, addressing um, similar rural issues issues and forestry issues, but in the Quebec. Context and and we see them as as in in tandem uh, working together and and 
thinking about the same issues, same regional issues that, that, uh, and rural issues that are occurring around the world, um, but in those two, two different locations. It's very helpful. And, and do you see uh, the next sort of maturation of this research in application to be at that scale of rural studio that you've just described? Or do you also see it in partnership with like Element 4 and Nordic structures um, and, and, and larger players like PCL up in Canada that, that could test it at a, at a larger scale? What are your thoughts? Absolutely. Kiel, maybe you want to talk a bit about the pipeline. Yeah, so, um, you know, we have a, at McGill, we have a larger kind of research platform called DCARB, um, which is a pipeline for, you know, developing, you know, technology, the fundamental science and technology development that, that you know, it's like Sal just presented, um, pushing that through some design build testing stages and, you know, data collection and sort of initial, let's say, field work examples. Um, that are live, uh, often in these rural conditions, um, and then leading all the way through um, some policy recommendations and et cetera. Um, so in that kind of larger platform, we have partners like the Rural Studio, that's the kind of applications and, and further testing and development uh, of the techniques. Um, but we also have large scale industrial partners like Nordic um, who is actually a, a very key partner in the design of this $19 million new facility, uh, which will also be a test bed for uh, all the techniques that Sal mentioned and, and, and many others um, as, a, as a research facility. Um, so I think within the larger research network, um, we have all those kinds of uh, you know, smaller scale community partners and, and academic partners and large scale industrial partners. Uh, that's, that's part of a bigger roadmap and pipeline for uh, accelerating the implementation uh, of this type of thinking and getting it into the building industry as, as quickly as possible. Do you, have an, do you also have interest in working with sort of public agencies in Canada or in North America in general? Is that an area in terms of standards or code? Yeah. Particularly, I think much more, you know, kind of coherent and fluid in, in the Canadian context. Um, I mean, we, we have any number of governmental, provincial partners, um, you know, the you know, entities that are involved with forestry and the timber industry in Quebec and, and, and at the federal level. Um, so that's, they're a part of this research at the kind of beginning, uh, but certainly at the kind of tail end of the pipeline in terms of getting, you know, altering policies and codes and that sort of thing, they're, they're going to be attuned to this all the way through. And, you know, that sets up the, the conversation for some meaningful change uh, at a very large scale. Um, uh, so yes, absolutely. It's kind of policy and, and, and governance is a big part of the kind of goal of this kind of larger uh, research horizon that Sal mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. Well, thank you very much, Sal, and thank you, Kiel, for coming on again and uh, sharing with us what's going on in uh, the research. Like I said before, we're going to put some links so people can find out more about uh, uh, Dr. Uh, um, Sal's work um, and also Professor Craig's work and also Kiel's work and more about the uh, center that you're uh, working on so um, folks can know how to, how to partner with you. It's kind of a new day in building science research. and. Uh, it's really exciting to see this happening and centers like this popping up uh, not only in Europe, but now in North America. So congratulations to both of you on, on uh, your success. And with that, uh, that's ModX for today. Thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.